everyone. Uh, welcome to Harmony Road uh, Baptist Church. Glad that you've uh, come uh, uh, despite the snow and uh, that uh, come to worship. And for those who are uh, at home, uh, w welcome as well. Uh, glad we got to live stream that uh, even in uh, bad weather, those who can't drive in the snow can still uh, watch online. Uh, so, uh, just a few announcements. Uh, so, monthly prayer meeting will be uh, Saturday, February 4th. I guess that's this Saturday. It will be on uh, Zoom. Uh, Zoom link info will follow. Uh, in uh, two weeks, uh, there will be an uh, open house at the church library that uh, Margaret will be uh, hosting and encouraging everyone to come. There will be some light refreshments, including uh, chocolate uh, right before Valentine's Day, in case you... Forgot to get some for your sweetie. Um, uh, and then uh, for uh, February 25th, it'll be a busy day. Uh, there will be the church business meeting. There will be training for those who are working with the children. And there will be a bridal shower for uh, Sarah Grosset. So uh, more details are in your bulletin if you're uh, uh, planning to come for uh, Saturday, February 25th. Uh, you might be here all day. All right, and now uh, we just uh, uh, turn our hearts to the Lord as we uh, approach Him in worship. I want to open a reading uh, from uh, Psalm uh, 51. <clears throat> Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Uh, and uh, just as uh, the snow covers everything, makes everything white, the blood of Jesus washes us white that we may approach the throne of God. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all, like Pastor John said, for braving the snow and coming out this morning. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. Um, thanks to Bruce, he's going to work with me, help me <laughs> on guitar. Our, our theme this morning, there seems to be an awful lot of songs about standing, but I'm going to get you to sit for this one, and then I'll get you to stand for the next one. So uh, anyway, if you'll join in on uh, an old song called Thy Loving Kindness. <laughs> sing that chorus please feel free i'd love to see people praising the lord all over the whole the whole church thy loving kindness is better than life thy loving kindness is better than life my lips shall praise thee thus will i bless thee
So I was telling Bruce this morning that um, years ago, my father used to lead the music at the Wesleyan church that I grew up in. And he said that you could not sing this song sitting down because you can't sing standing on the promises if you're sitting on the premises. So, <laughs> and I don't know why that stayed with me all these years, but it has. So I'm going to get you all to stand. We're going to sing standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Four. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of Christ my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, moving in my Savior. You can be seated. I think Pastor Dave is speaking this morning on promises. And we have many, many promises in the Bible. But the one thing that we have to do back to God is to worship and honor him. We're going to sing this song, I Stand in Awe of You. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension. Like nothing ever seen or heard Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description Majesty enthroned above And I stand, I stand Stay. 
Moses saw a burning bush. And as he went to approach the bush, God said to him, don't do that, Moses. You're on holy ground. And we're going to sing that song this morning. This song is based on that scripture. If you know the verses and you want to sing along with me, go ahead. I know you'll know the chorus because we've done the chorus lots of times. But if you want to sing along with the verses, please feel free to do so. As I walked through the door, I sensed his presence, and I knew this was the place where love abounds, for this is the temple. Jehovah God Almighty, we are standing in His presence on holy ground. We are standing. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that as we stand in this church this morning, we are in fact standing on holy ground and that you are with us this morning. And Lord, we just pray that you would just anoint each person that's here this morning a special touch, a special blessing from you. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. We do stand in awe of you and we are just in awe that you love each one of us and that you sent your son to die on the cross for us. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do for us day in and day out, and you are so faithful, and your promises are true. Father, I pray that you would bless Pastor Dave as he preaches this morning and he breaks the word to us. Father, I just pray that you would touch him and give him power and anointing in Jesus' name. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you. 
you appreciate yeah. Thanks, John. All right. So it's uh, just time to come to the Lord in prayer. And uh, yeah, it's a great thing that we're able to approach uh, the throne of glory, approach his presence, him who is king over all, ruler of the universe. And we're uh, coming now to approach him. And you can see all the prayer requests uh, in your bulletin. And I won't necessarily go through all of them, but uh, those are for uh, you to be continuing in prayer. And uh, uh, again, uh, praying uh, and uh, just one, one thing, uh, Joan, who was able to come home from the hospital after being uh, admitted recently and uh, and then, again, praying for uh, the church and praying for uh, growth in, uh, well, faithfulness and uh, growth in number, that uh, God uh, would be uh, sending his spirit to build his church in this place. Uh, join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you that uh, we're able to come before you, you who uh, spoke the earth into existence. We know that uh, you have uh, all power, all authority. Yet uh, it's uh, by your blood that we're able to come before you, that uh, we are washed white as snow. Pray that uh, we would truly be thankful for that, that this would be our, our basis, our only assurance, is that uh, by your wounds we have been healed, by your wounds we have been made holy. And I pray that uh, we would see uh, more people coming to faith in you, Lord, that uh, we would see uh, the faith of those around us growing, seeing our own faith growing as we approach you, Lord, that you would continue to sanctify us, purify us, help us to lay aside every weight of sin that holds us back and, and run the race with endurance. Pray for healthy, God-fearing churches uh, to grow and be strengthened in our community and in, in our, our province and in our nation, Lord. And I pray in particular for uh, Renaissance Baptist Church in Brooklyn. Pray that uh, you would be uh, working in the people there, that uh, you'd be uh, growing them in faith and strengthening uh, their pastor and their leaders, O oh Lord. Pray that uh, they might be a faithful gospel witness for many years to come in, in the community of Brooklyn. I pray for... Justin Trudeau, Lord, pray. You've told us to pray for our leaders, and we don't necessarily know exactly what to pray, but pray that you would humble him, whether you, you humble him to bring him to faith in you, or if you humble him to remove him from his position of power, Lord. We pray that uh, you would be working in his heart, working uh, even in our nation, working for the good of our nation, and in all the many leaders, all those elected officials, all those unelected officials, Lord, and pray also for uh, our king, King Charles, that uh, he might govern and rule well in the limited capacity that he has given our, our order. But Lord, we pray for those who are in authority over us. Lord, I, I pray for uh, Joan as uh, we thank you that she's able to come home from the hospital and Yet, uh, we pray for uh, comfort for her in this uh, ongoing sickness. Pray for those struggling with cancer, Lord, Faith, Morgan, Linda, and Gwen. Pray that uh, in their treatments, you might be bringing this uh, uh, cancer, this disease into remission. And yet, Lord, we, we pray for, for comfort for the families as it is hard on them. And yet, we pray for faith in, in those individuals that... Uh, as they uh, undergo this, uh, the treatments needed for these, the various forms that they have, that uh, you would be with them, that they would have a, a special sense of your presence. That we know that those who, who suffer the most need the greatest, uh, greatest uh, amount of your spirit, Lord. And yet for us, we pray that uh, you would be... Uh, is welling up in us that uh, we'd be praying all the more, knowing that it's by your power and not uh, any amount of worrying, not any amount of working, not anything that we can do, but only your work, O oh Lord, that uh, can heal the sick and bring them back to full health. And we pray for that, O oh Lord. And I pray for the 
the homeless, the uh, marginalized, the those on, on drugs, those who are uh, suffering with mental illness, those who have nothing, O oh Lord, pray that uh, we might be your hands and feet to those who are the least among us. Pray for those in the church that uh, any in need, that they would feel confident to reach out to uh, us here at the church and that uh, we would be generous uh, to our brothers and sisters around us and yet, Lord, even beyond that, to those outside the church, to those all around, those uh, in the most depressed parts of our city, that uh, uh, we might be uh, those who uh, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and uh, bring hope to those who are hopeless. Give us the words to speak that beyond just meeting the physical needs of those around us, that uh, we would be proclaiming your hope that uh, the spiritual needs may be met. Lord, I pray for Pastor Dave as he shares your word, that uh, you would be empowering him by your spirit and yet be working in the hearts and minds of each and every one of us here that uh, we might be impacted by your word, knowing that we listen not to uh, just the thoughts that uh, uh, Pastor Dave has for us, but... uh, that uh, we listen to your word and what it is that you have given to us, that that we might be built up uh, to do the work that you've called us to. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. It's great to see little Ethan here this morning. He's out, I know, but I heard him uh, cooing along, and I heard some. I saw some smiling faces, and uh, it's great for him to be with us this morning. He's an answer to prayer, and so we're thankful. Uh, today's passage I'm reading is out of Matthew chapter five. I'm doing the very long route of going through uh, the Christian counterculture of uh, the great uh, Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five, six, and seven. I encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter five. I'll be reading verses thirty-three uh, to thirty-seven. Matthew. 5:33 to 37 Again Jesus says you have heard that it was said to the people long ago do not break your oath but keep your oaths you have made to the Lord but I tell you do not swear at all either by heaven for it is God's throne or by the earth it is God's footstool or by Jerusalem for it is the city of the great king And do not swear by your own head, for you cannot even make one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. May God bless the reading of his word to us this morning. Let's pray and give him thanks. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for your word. And sometimes, Lord, your word just hits us in the face and I confess to you, God, this morning, this is one of those passages. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as you um, minister to us this morning through your word, as you uh, speak through me, God, your servant, I pray that your voice would be heard and not mine. I pray, Heavenly Father, that as we have uh, things in our lives that we need to address, I pray, God, you brought this passage to light for this purpose. God, that we will hear from you and we will walk away Uh, having heard your word. Overcome any obstacles, God, in my life and in the life of us as listeners, and I pray, God, and thank you for the joy and the beauty of being able to open your word and to wrestle with its meaning. Pray for your spirit's guidance. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Years ago, at the very beginning of my time in ministry, I had a very difficult situation that developed, and it is highlighted in today's passage. I think about it every time I come to this passage in God's Word. I had a a person who came to me, approached me, and and asked if I would be willing to do something for him, and it was something that would be months down the road, and I was so excited to reconnect with this person, hadn't seen him for a long time, and I was excited to be able to be a part of this uh, commitment, and so I, I, I promised to him, yes, absolutely, I will be there for you. But then as life happens, and many of us know sometimes life happens and gets in the way of things, I had a, a circumstance develop within my life that 
prevented me from following through on that promise. And I remember wrestling with it because on one hand, I know how much I had to keep true to my promises. On the other hand, I also wrestled with what was the right thing in this situation. And it was a difficult, difficult time. And it was a great learning experience for me to learn early on in ministry the importance of promises. Before we get too far into this passage this morning, I want to explain the difference between promises and oaths. Promises are a commitment that you make to someone else. An example of this could be, hey, can you spot me a few bucks and I'll get it back to you next week? You know, can you buy me a coffee? I'll pay you back for it or whatever. Uh, You know, uh, something that's very simple. It's a one-way thing. It's very much in our control. Promises can also still be a little bit more complex than that, though, because, for example, in a wedding commitment, promises are made not just by one person, but by two people. And so we have the complexity of two promises trying to work together uh, to uh, live up to what they promise on their wedding day. John spoke in his prayer time about political leaders and how it is difficult to sometimes trust the promise of political leaders because we don't know whether they really mean what they say or whether it's just saying something so that they can get the votes, so that they can get in power. And it's hard to discern those promises, but they are promises that are made to someone else. I think of uh, the Disney movie that my kids basically, one of the Disney movies my kids grew up in with Aladdin, you know, Aladdin and Jasmine. And Aladdin uh, found this lamp and the genie and had three wishes. And in those three wishes, the first wish Aladdin wished for because he was head over heels in love with Jasmine is he said, I want to be able to uh, be her husband. I want to marry Jasmine one day. And, but that wasn't permitted, so instead it made him a prince. So the first wish was to make him a prince. And then as later on in the story develops, the movie develops, uh, we see that uh, Aladdin is uh, near drowning in a situation, and so his second promise is to keep himself from drowning. And he's got one wish left, one promise left that he could ask for. And he had promised already to Genie that he would give him freedom with his final wish. And so Aladdin finds himself in this difficult situation where there was something that he wanted to do, but at the same time, he had promised to this genie that he would give him the freedom. Promises are something that we make every day. Promises are something that we make probably without even recognizing that we make them. Uh, This was made aware to me when I was traveling around Europe backpacking uh, after my first uh, four years of Bible school. And uh, when we were traveling around Ireland, people in Ireland always had this comment that stuck with me, and it was, Lord willing. And so, we'll see, you on, we'll see you on Sunday, Lord willing. We'll come by your place later on tonight, Lord willing. And they always added Lord willing to it, and I thought, what a strange thing to say. But I realize the importance of Lord willing, because we make a lot of promises without thinking necessarily about what we are doing. Oath, on the other hand, is a little different. An oath is a little different. It is a commitment that we make. It's a promise that we make, but it invokes God. It brings God into the equation. And so, uh, you know, we see that simple uh, example when somebody goes into court and they're asked to testify. And so they stand there and the Bible is presented. And do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth so help you God? You put your hand on the Bible and I do. And that is an oath. That is a commitment that you're not just making a promise, but you're actually invoking the Lord's name into that promise. At Christian weddings, it's very interesting the nature, I've done a lot of weddings, and it's interesting the nature of different styles of weddings. If you have a Christian wedding, couples often are invoking the name of the Lord and that the Lord will give me strength to live up to my promises, my vows, I commit to you that day. Certainly that's a prayer that I have for couples when I'm marrying a Christian couple, that God will give them the strength, that the promises that they're making are in, actually in front of God himself. Their, their testimony that they're giving in front of God is their witness that they will fulfill these oaths on that day. There's a problem with promises. And the problem with promises is that we make promises to increase our credibility. We make promises to try and ensure that the other person will trust in us, and we don't always follow through. 
If we take a, a, a step back from this passage and we look at the passage that Jesus is speaking here in Matthew chapter 5, we have to go back to where he said to us, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the world. You are the thing that brings the presence of God into this world. Your life is to be a reflection of who God is. His very nature is to be seen in who you are and what you do. And there's nothing wrong with making promises. When we are to promise to pay off our mortgage company the money that we owe them for the house, there's nothing wrong with that promise. And there's other promises that there's nothing wrong with. But problem is sometimes we cannot live up to our promises. We are not always faithful. Sometimes we fail. And sometimes when we fail, we come back and we make a promise that kind of transitions from a promise to an oath. We start to say, oh, I promise I'll do it this time because the last time maybe we weren't so faithful. Or I promise, some of the phrases I was thinking about when we were saying this word, uh, thinking about this word promise, uh, we, we, we swear on a stack of Bibles like one is not enough. <laughs> you know? I promise on my mother's grave. More serious, because now we're speaking about people who are disrespecting the dead. I swear on my mother's grave I'm going to do this. Like Promises and oaths kind of flow freely from our mouths, and sometimes, sometimes they are grandiose statements trying to get the other person to trust that we will do what we say we will do. And Jesus really isn't addressing promises that are lived out, but he is addressing the problem that we don't always go good on our promises. That sometimes life is in the middle of promises and gets in the way of promises, and it's difficult because it is beyond our control. But Jesus is speaking very clearly in this passage about oaths, about oaths in verses 33 to 37. And it brings back this whole concept that an oath, because it was invoking the name of the Lord, it was a very serious statement. If you made an oath in the presence of God and the witness of God and were asking for his strength to carry it out, it was a very serious statement. And if that oath was broken, there was very serious consequences. And the Pharisees were uncomfortable with this. And Jesus is addressing specifically what they had done with oaths in this passage. The Pharisaical problem was this. They had taken the words of the oath and they rearranged them so that there wasn't the binding contract that an oath was supposed to have in the presence of God. We see that if you flip into Matthew chapter 23, verses 16 to 22. Matthew 23, just go ahead a few chapters in the Bible. And here in Matthew 23, with all the woes that Jesus lays out, Starting at verse 16, he says, Woe to you, speaking to the Pharisees, Woe to you, you blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold in the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools. What is greater, the gold or the temple, that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, what is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And he also swears by the temple, swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. See, what the Pharisees had done is they had taken the oaths serious binding agreements between people and God, and they had taken out the seriousness and the binding nature of it by inserting different words. In that passage in Matthew, instead of swearing by God, it's by God's temple. Instead of swearing by God, it's by the altar or by heaven. Not swearing by God, but taking him out of the equation in order that they would allow people to swear to do things and not be held as accountable for them. And it's interesting for the Pharisees, they were so focused on stuff. The gold held more value than the altar. The, the things, 
of value in the Pharisees' minds were financial, money, monetary. They weren't spiritual. And this is how Jesus confronts them. By removing God, they believed that people could be justified in breaking an oath without consequences. And Jesus condemns this act. And he puts everything back under God. In the passage that we looked at in Matthew chapter 5, uh, he, Jesus says, do not swear by anything, by heaven. So this was a word that they had used to substitute in for, for God. And Jesus says, don't swear by heaven. Because why? Because it is God's throne. Don't swear by earth. Why? Because it is where God's footstool is. Don't swear by Jerusalem, even though you want to invoke some kind of religiosity to it. Why? Because it is God's city. You get this beautiful image, don't you, of God in this. The one who is in control, the King of kings, Lord of lords. The one who is sitting on his throne in heaven and he is so immense that his feet are landing on our planet. What a beautiful image of God. What a humble image of this world that we are the footstool of God. Sometimes we lift up our world to be the throne and we make God the footstool, which is wrong. God is this glorious, magnificent presence that his throne is in heaven, his footstool is the earth, and his city is the people who will gather in his name and worship him. Jesus goes on to say, even your head, you don't have control even over your head, whether your hairs are white or black or few or many. I had to bring that one up. We have no control over these things. We don't even have control over our heads. And God is ultimately so in control of everything. And we have to be so careful. We don't swear by anything. We, we have to be careful because we don't have control over the things that happen to us in life. Only God is in control. So Jesus says, don't swear by. And then later in verse 37, he says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. In other words, simply live out your life in truth for God. Don't try to embellish by extra statements that make people more likely to trust in you. Simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Because the truth of the matter in this passage that Jesus is getting at and that I'm trying to get at is that God is the only one in whom we can trust for promises. We had three, three funerals in the last uh, three or four weeks in the church, right? Oh, well, they're kind of weddings too, in a sense. But there are three funerals. And you know, it struck me as we were standing around uh, Bob Prochaska's uh, gravesite on Friday, uh, watching uh, his urn be lowered into the ground, just the finality of life in that moment. What do we have left to hold on to in that moment? All we have is the promises of God. There's nothing more we can do when our life is gone. There's nothing more we can say. There's nothing more we can do to, to try and make things happen. We are totally helpless. We are in the hands of God at that point. All people have to face that truth. And the good news is those who know God know that he is the God who is a promise-keeping God. He has control over all things. He has power to do all things. He knows the best outcome in all situations. His promises are outstanding. Just as that image of him sitting on the throne and earth is his footstool, God's promises are way beyond anything that we can promise. God's promises are meant to move us. And his promises challenge our unbelief. They challenge our our promises. They challenge us and make our promises look a little silly at times because God never fails. But God's promises are meant to move us. They're meant to motivate us. God doesn't need to give us promises to increase his credibility. He doesn't need to say, I promise I will do this because, oh, I didn't quite fulfill it the last time. That's not God. That's us. God says, I will do what I will say. 
We see this beautifully in this passage in Genesis chapter 22 with Abraham. Remember when God asked Abraham, said, go up the uh, mountain and, and offer your son Isaac on the altar. Hmm, there's a challenge. And so Abraham is faithful, believing that God will provide a way out. The passage is clear. But Abraham goes up, and he goes up to the mountain, and he's right at the top, and he's right about to do the most horrific thing I could ever imagine in my my limited mindset. And God intervenes by bringing a, a, a ram into a thicket, and here you can sacrifice this instead of instead of Isaac, and immediately after that beautiful provision by God, an angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven and says these words, this is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I swear by my own name, I will certainly bless you, Abraham. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky, like the sand in the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of the enemies and uh, and, and through your descendants all nations on the earth will be blessed. All because, why? Because you have obeyed me. This is a promise that God made to Abraham because of his faithfulness. It's a promise that is made by God to stir up faithfulness in us and stir up faithfulness in those who would follow Abraham. And God made true on his promise. When you think about it, today, we are in the line of Abraham. (laughs) Through Jesus Christ, we are followers of Jesus Christ. God has gone good on his promise to Abraham that descendants around the world will place their trust in God. Right now, there's people around the world who are trusting in God. Every country, all ages, and for all eras, since that promise, God has been fulfilling it. And it should inspire faith in us. It should encourage our faith. When we see these stories and other stories of God made promises and went good on them, it should encourage faith in us. We will encounter broken promises of people in this world. It will happen, I guarantee you. You will encounter people who will say they will do something and they will not do it. But here's the good news. God keeps his promises. He will always act as he says he will act. In 2 Peter 3, verse 13, according to his promise, he will bring a new heaven and a new earth when this one passes away. What a great promise for those who pass away in the name of the Lord. They know that there's a new heaven and a new earth coming. In Numbers 23, 16, God is not a man that he should lie, not a human being, that he should change his mind. Does he speak and not act? Does his promise not be fulfilled by his word? In Joshua 1 verse 5, he said, I will not fail you or forsake you. These are promises of God, and they're precious and beautiful for us to hold on to. And ours pale in comparison to these. So whatever you're going through today, I encourage you to heavily lean on the promises of God. They will never fail. He will never fail you. Or maybe it's to say that the promises of God do not fail because God never fails. He never fails. His promises are meant to move and to motivate us. They are meant to instill hope in us. They're meant to give us courage when we're facing odds that we don't know how it's going to work out. They are meant to defeat feelings that we have. And there's a lot of feelings. We were speaking uh, with some of the leaders of the church this week just about how we sense around our communities there is such a darkness. There's so many young people killing young people. There's so much darkness going on in our world. And and we can say, yeah, it's because of two years of COVID or whatever we can say, but there's just a heaviness that is in our communities these days. We're seeing it lived out on a daily basis. But these promises of God are meant to give us peace when things around us are chaotic. It's a promise of God. For us, they're meant to blow our minds away and settle our hearts at the same time. They are gifts of His grace to us. And God confronts our unbelief and encourages true belief in Him. He is God and He will do as He says. He is God and He will do as He says. So, should we make promises? (laughs) Okay, let's get to 
a point here. Should we make promises? It's interesting, I was reading through studying for this, and somebody uh, highlighted this passage in Matthew chapter 26, where Jesus has been arrested. He's before the Sanhedrin, and uh, the high priest is challenging him. Uh, a couple of false witnesses have come along and said, oh, well, actually, witnesses came along and said, well, he said he's going to destroy the temple and, and restore it in three days. So the chief priest at, uh, attacks Jesus in this moment. He asks a series of questions. And the priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer these witnesses? This is the testimony that these men are bringing against you. But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. An oath. I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus' response was simple. You have said so. You said it. I am. You said it. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. If we make promises in this world, we need to recognize that these promises are serious. That they hold consequences if we break them. Not because it's a weakness in us and that, but it's because our promises are supposed to reflect the promises of God lived out through us. God is the promise-keeping God. As followers of God, we should be going good on the promises we make. Why? Because then we are light in this world, pointing to the glory of God. Honest people do not need to resort to oaths, not adding or invoking some name into some statement in order to make their credibility more believable. Truly, we need to let our yes be yes and our no be no. Don't swear by, Jesus says. Don't try to embellish things to make your life more believable. We are to live our lives as a true reflection of the light of Jesus in us. A yes should be enough. A no should be enough. We don't need to add to that. Promises are serious. Oaths are serious. And we need to be very careful about when we make them before people or even before the Lord especially. We need to be careful. Because he is the promise-keeping God. His promises are good. And we are to reflect that goodness in our world. I am so thankful for the lives of the three people that we have celebrated recently in funerals. Because not that they had it all together, not that they were all perfect, but because their lives lived as a living testimony to who God was. They trusted in him. May our lives reflect that as well as we live in our daily walk with our Lord. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, so much for uh, these words of Jesus, uh, Lord, that challenge us, help us to reflect on our life, God, and help us to think about how sometimes we say things, Lord, without really thinking about them. I pray, God, that you will help us to trust in your promises, to be faithful shepherds of your promises, God, to see them lived out in Scripture day after day as we encounter your word. Lord, that we will read through your word and we will say a promise of God, a promise of God, a promise of God. We'll see, God, how much you have blessed us through your promises. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we reflect on your goodness, God, that we will recognize our own need for you, for your strength, and for these promises in our lives in order to bring hope and peace and joy to us and to those around us. Help us, God, to live a life that reflects your goodness and brings peace into this world. We pray in his name. Amen. I'd ask that you would stand as we closing him, which is an old hymn called Jesus Never Fails. Jesus.
Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Heaven and earth may pass away, but Jesus never Just remember he is near and he will not fail. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Heaven and earth may pass away, but Jesus never Trust his everlasting power, Jesus will not fail. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Jesus has given us this command that we are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, Jesus says, I will be with you until the very end of the age. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, for this great commission that he gives to us to go and to live as people who shine your light in this world. God, may we do so in every act, in every word that we speak, Lord. May they be carefully chosen, God, so as not to lead anyone away from you, but, Lord, will draw people towards you. And God, help us to hold firm to the confident fact, the assurance that we have of your promise that Jesus is with us every step of our day. God, help us to acknowledge the presence of your Son. Help us, God, to listen to the nudging of your Spirit in us, that we might live for you, complete and full for you, not for ourselves in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.